How you doing? Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. You nice. like it? Huh? You like it? Yeah, nice little setup. You're on live now, so. No. Uh, I'm... Yeah, that's why I said nice little. You oh, like okay. It? I thought you meant like my setup. I'm like, no, like the hat. I wear it. Until... <laughs> okay, you got it. <laughs> yeah. Um, so let me know when you're ready. If if everything is straight and um, we can kind of start. So, okay. Got to stay hybrid. Okay, we'll do. <laughs> we'll do. Um, Ashley, um, I like the like the little hat Austin had. Yeah. Thanks. Like it came today. Oh yeah. Oh cool. Cool. The second cool, it I came, know. I was like, yes, I don't have to do my hair. <laughs> Just letting you know you're on Facebook Live now. So, <laughs> perfect, okay. So, um, usually we um, do a countdown um, early in the studio to give me a countdown, but now, you know, since we're doing this Zoom, I give myself a countdown, so. You got four minutes, I think. Huh? Do you start exact? are we starting exactly at five, right? Um, actually, if everything's okay and stuff like that, we can start now if you wish. Oh, okay. I just didn't want like people to miss if they're tuning in at five o'clock, you know? Well, I'm one of those people. It's like, oh, the show doesn't come on until this exact time. <laughs> Never, you know. <laughs> well, sometimes we're early, sometimes, you know, we're late. So okay. this makes up for the time that we're, we're late. Got it. So, gotcha. Okay. So you ready? I'm ready. Okay. So we'll start to drive at five in three, two, one. Good evening and welcome to the drive at five on intellectualradio.com slash iHeart radio station. I'm your host Roman coming to you live via Zoom today. Don't forget to stay tuned to intellectualradio.com after the drive at five for Warriors Talk with Rochelle at 6 p.m. Tonight, my guest is an entrepreneur, CEO, and founder of 40 Acres. They, they do fresh market, fresh produce in the Austin community. Please give a drive at five. Welcome back to Elizabeth or slash Liz um, Albanon. Correct? Abuno. Abuno. Okay. I'm, I'm still getting there. Any day <laughs> well, now. Any <laughs> right. <laughs> so please give intellectualradio.com slash iHeartRadio Station um, an update since the last time you were on the drive. It's been a while. I think it was pre-pandemic that since I've I've been here. So a lot has happened since then. So I'm Liz and I am the owner and operator and founder of 40 Acres Fresh Market. And uh, last time I was on the drive at five, I think that we were in the middle of a monthly pop-up market series uh, in the West, in the, in the Austin community. Uh, then the pandemic happened and all of the locations where we did our pop-up markets shut down. Um, couldn't be inside anywhere starting in March, 2020. Gosh, it's, it's been a while, hasn't it? Um, and so we pivoted to a smaller part of our business, which was delivery. And so we delivered produce to people's homes and that blew up with the pandemic. Uh, so our business grew probably like tenfold over the course of the year, just strictly on getting produce delivered to people's homes. Um, thankfully, with the with, you know, with time, we have been able to move back into doing pop-up markets as well. So we also run the Austin Town Hall Farmers Market uh, that's sponsored by the city of Chicago. Been doing that for the last two years and we'll continue to do that. And then in October of 2020, I uh, made a big step towards the ultimate goal, which has always been to open a fresh market in Austin. Um, we move towards that goal by securing the location for our first store in October 2020 and are now currently deep in that de commercial development project. 
Okay, as an entrepreneur, you decided to tackle one of the most hardest tasks in the Black community, and that is food deserts. Why you think it is important to tackle food desert in the Black community? Uh, so first, I really hate the term food desert. Um, one, deserts are actually very lively ecosystems. They're not this barren wasteland. So it's, it's kind of a, it's a misnomer. Um, also, the word desert occurs to a naturally occurring environment. And I don't, and neighborhoods that don't have access to affordable quality, fresh food, um, that's not a natural thing that just happens. Uh, it but is- what, what, But can I interrupt? Why do you think it's a misnomer? Because, because like I said, a desert is a naturally occurring environment, it's a naturally occurring climate. And to call a neighborhood a food desert is a very benign term because it implies that some neighborhoods just, just don't have affordable access to fresh food, that it's like, like that is a naturally occurring environment instead of something that is the result of man-made decisions from everything like white flight, redlining, um, where develop disinvestment, et cetera. And so the term I prefer to use when describing areas that are under accessed with something as basics, food is basic. Do you eat Roman? You, you, you eat, right? <laughs> of course, yeah, exactly. as you can every, tell, right? Every, well, as, me too, well, everybody eats. And so this something as basic as food, healthy food, food that comes from the earth that occurs naturally is not available. Um, when that condition, when a neighborhood is living in that condition, I prefer to call that food apartheid because it actually, it actually explicitly says that this condition is one, a matter of segregation. It is often based along racial lines and um, it's man-made. It's, it's the result of years of bad policy, inaction, neglect, and it actually makes somebody responsible for the condition. And then if somebody's responsible for it, that means people are also responsible for, for changing it. So let's, let's describe the, the food apartheid for a minute in the situation behind it in the Austin community, particularly because your, um, your 40 acres is based in the Austin community, describe that um, that food apartheid to us in the Austin community, just in case people are not familiar with yeah. the Austin community on intellectualradio.com. So, you know, for most people, where they get their their food is from the grocery store, or you go to restaurants. Um, in Austin, Austin is a community of over 95,000 people spread out across seven and a half square miles. It is the second largest community area in both population and land area in the city of Chicago. To service that many people across that much land, there are only three grocery stores of varying quality. There is, I think maybe two sit down restaurants on Madison Avenue and very few places where you can get a, a healthy meal. There is, the neighborhood is awash in fast food, liquor stores, corner stores that sell um, cheap, highly processed foods. Uh, but in order to get healthy food that nourishes your body, that keeps you, that keeps you healthy, Austin is severely under-resourced for the number of people who live in the community. And we see the results of this in the higher rates of diabetes, high blood pressure, kidney disease, obesity, and other diet-related illnesses. And what was interesting is that when COVID hit, Austin was one of the neighborhoods hardest hit with the number of deaths. And a lot of that is because people are living with pre-existing conditions. People are living sick. And 
a lot of these conditions, they're not genetic. They are not something that just occurs. It is completely environmental, also based on the foods we're eating. And I know it's easy to say, well, why don't people just eat better? Um, it's harder to eat better when you have to work harder to access better foods to eat. We are all busy. We all, a lot of us, you know, we work long hours. Uh, many people are taking care of children. Other people are taking care of children and parents. What we don't have time for, what a lot of people don't have time for is to travel, you know, 20, 30 minutes from home to just to purchase affordable, healthy, good food. So you'll grab, you'll grab what's there. I'm gonna give you a story. And it's kind of is like a microcosm of, of what happens. The city had a bunch of budget hearings uh, last fall. I don't know if you remember that they were, they wanted to like have public forums about the city budget. And mainly those those budget hearings were via Zoom. No, they were in person. In person, okay. Yes. So I went to one at Malcolm X College, and I had a, I'd had some food maybe a half hour before I left, so I thought I was fine. Um, and I get to the meeting, and all of a sudden I'm ravenous, and I don't know why. I'm just hungry, <laughs> and there's no food there. The only thing that's on the table is a bunch of chips, candy bars, and junk food. Now I'm in this meeting, am I going to leave this meeting and try to go find something, find some place where I can find an apple, I can find a snack, I can find something. No, I'm gonna eat what's in front of me. And so, I mean, I'm hungry. So one bag of chips turns into two and three and then the Skittles and then the Starburst. And it's just like a bloodbath of wrappers in front of me because that's what was there. If there had been an orange, an apple, a banana, I probably would have reached for those first and then maybe I would have had one bag of chips, but there would have been some type of balance. And our neighborhoods are very representative of that table. When we want something, what's right there, what's immediate, what's easiest to grab is stuff that ultimately kills us. And that's the situation of food apartheid in the Austin community. And that's how we see it manifested. Have you had this type of discussion with leaderships in the Austin community, um, decision makers, um, just, just like the decision makers that you were at the meeting, at the budget meeting saying, okay, your, your, your action speaks volumes to the community and to business owners such as myself you got to have an equal representation, especially what I represent in, in, in fresh fruits and vegetables. So have you had that discussion with um, decision makers? Why sometimes you are what you eat and that represents the community, like you just said, and, and basically we need some type of balance right now. These conversations have been happening long before I moved to Chicago. I mean, um, Yes, I, I have the con I've been having the conversation since since 2018. But when I first, you know, moseyed my butt down to Austin, like, hey, you know, I think I want to open a grocery store here. Here's what I want to do. There was already um, a group of people getting together trying to build a co-op in Austin. It's not as though I came in and shined a light on something that people just didn't realize was happening. It, Everybody knows that and has known that food is a, is a challenged area in the Austin community. Um, you have the Austin Community Food Co-op that has been organizing and, and trying to get a co-op off the ground since you know, probably 2017. Um, 40 Acres Fresh Market is has been around since 2018 and, and I've been beating this drum. Westside Health Authority is beating this drum. Um, you go to community meetings like with like the Leaders Network or Austin Coming Together, the Austin Coming Together, the Quality of Life Plan, Austin Forward Together. One of the points in the Quality of Life Plan and how they want to improve life in Austin centered around the, the evangel evangelism of healthy eating and 
more healthy food options in the community. I, I guess no one needed me to say anything <laughs> because it's already well known and people have been trying to figure this out for a long time. So it's it's not for, for lack of awareness that this situation- Well, there, there is a difference between just rhetoric and actions behind it. When it's you're fair. at the table, when fair. you're at the table, you're basically putting, putting action behind your rhetoric and people are seeing that. Give us the difference when you're at these meetings pushing for an agenda such as the importance of um, fresh produce in, in a food apartheid, as you put it. I guess I'm trying to understand your question. Are you, are you asking if people are ignoring me? Are you asking? No, I'm not, I'm not saying that. I'm, I'm basically saying that there's um, action behind your mm -hmm. rhetoric, meaning yeah. I, as we're having this discussion, there is action behind it. Yes. When you go to some of these meetings, people see just the rhetoric and nothing is being done. When, when you first attend these meetings, and this is my question, when you first attend these meetings, people just see rhetoric. When something is about to be done, when something is going to happen, where's action behind the rhetoric until you step in? Am I kind of correct on this assessment? Hmm. You can have a plan in place. You yeah. can have a plan in place. Yeah. But if there's no action behind it. I No, I, I feel what you're saying. I, I don't know. I, I, I think I, I cannot talk to what was going on before I, before I, before I thought of 40 acres and before I was like, Austin's where I want to do it. You know, I can't speak to the actions people were taking in 2017, 2016, 2015. I know that the Austin Community Food Co-op had already been organizing. So that's some action behind it. But organizing a co-op is a very long, intensive process. And so that just, it takes a long time. And then, you know, if somebody leaves the team, especially a key person leaves the team, then you're almost starting over from scratch. So they've had to start over a couple of times. Um, whereas with me and 40 Acres, from the beginning, I've driven 40 Acres. I've had great support and, and partnership within the community, but ultimately I make the decision about what we do, how we move and, and our progress, right? So I'm not waiting for anybody else. I'm just gonna go do, um, whether that's always the right approach or not. Um, I guess, yes, I did put a lot of action behind my rhetoric. I, I went out and I, found space and I did pop-up markets and I kept doing pop-up markets and I would speak at events about, about, you know, fresh food. And I would encourage community. I remember when you did, um, what's it called? When you did a dinner, the, 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 the soul food dinner. So, yeah, the soul food powwow or no, it was before the soul food powwow. It was the, it was the Halloween party thing that you did. And I think I kind of got on you. I was like, where's the fruit? Yes, I understand it's Halloween and there's candy and stuff for the kids, but like, where's the healthy option? Is going to like community meetings and saying, is going to the national night out that the 15th precinct would have and saying, it's great that you guys are given hot dogs and chips, but where's a banana? Where's an apple? Where's some healthy option that the kids can eat? Because in meetings, we talk about how we have to get healthier as a community, but then in our actions, we're still just, we're, we're still presenting the junk. And I'm not saying that like we can't have those foods, but at least have a counterpoint to that. If you have the apples and the grapes and the oranges here, I trust me, people will take it and they do. So, I mean, that's been, that's been my course of action is just kind of carrying, you know, my end of this banner and then also like trying to support others that are carrying it. Um, there's, I don't know if people know this, there's, there's a whole farm in Austin. There's many like small gardens and farms. PCC Austin Farm has been around since probably 20, 2017, 2016, 2017. They have a whole farm on Lotus. And every summer they have um, weekly 
farm stands where they're selling the food that they grow right there in the farm. So there's a, been a lot of action. And I think what we're starting to see now is those little pockets of action are starting to come together to say like, we're all trying to affect this issue in different ways. How do we work together um, to make more of an impact? And I think that's, that's what you're seeing now. Um, so it's, it's moved beyond talk to, to concrete action. I think the next step is how do we disseminate what's going on throughout the community so that people know? Because I guarantee you, if I walk down the street and I tap somebody on the shoulder and I was like, did you know about the PCC Austin farm? People would be like, no, I didn't know about it. Or did you know that about the, the farmer's market at Austin Town Hall? They'd be like, I didn't know about it. If I said, did you know that there's a three day a week pop-up produce market on, on Laramie at by the hand club um, where you can shop at and they take snap and have great fruits and vegetables and it's run by the kids at by the hand club. They'd be like, I didn't know about that. If I asked them if you know about 40 acres fresh market, they'd probably be like, I don't know what you're talking about. You know? So it's a matter of like, how do we take what's going on and the action that's happening and let more people know that these resources are here. We don't have to talk about, we wish we had this and that. They're starting to grow. We just need to support and use them. Don't you think it's almost like people are used to the norm? Basically, mm -hmm. I can go to Oak Park or outside the community versus inside my community and it's hard to break away from that. And it's kind of like out of sight, out of mind. What are your thoughts on, on that? Because you're saying it could be messaging. However, if people are used to going to Pete's in Oak Park, if people are used to going outside the community to get their uh, fresh produce, again, out of sight, out of mind, your thoughts on that? I 100% agree with you. It, it's, it's going to take a major sea change and shift in how people think about Austin. When a community has been divested from for so long, after a while, residents just believe there aren't, th these types of good things don't exist here. And you adapt, you adjust and you, and you, you adapt and you find new ways of, of getting, you find other ways to get what you need. And so you're not even looking for a farmer's market in your neighborhood. You're not looking for a new grocery store because you just assume that that's not what we have. And so it takes, it takes a lot of engagement. It takes a lot of effort to capture, first capture people's attention again and say, hey, look, we're here and get them to notice that you're saying something and then convince them that what you're saying is real, that it's valuable, that it's for them and that you have every intention of, of staying and, and being sustainable and, it can, and being something that they can rely on. It takes a long time to build trust. And I, like I said, I'm not from Chicago, right? When I first came around in 2018, I mean, you've known me for years now, Roman. I mean, people were like, that's cute, you know, cool. She's got some fruits and vegetables. She's doing these little pop-up markets. She's saying she wants to build that's a grocery That's not thing. how you approach me, but that's a different story. No, I mean, listen, I approach <laughs> everybody like a bull in a china shop. I'm talking about the reaction that I get, that I got initially. The reaction was, that's, that's nice. Like, no, actually, not, that's not necessarily true because um, the reaction, if you're talking about, I would say some in the Austin community, because some people didn't give you that type of reaction, I only can speak for myself. I'm not talking about you. I'm talking right. about just like a general reaction. It took, it took time for me to build credit. My point is it took time for me to build credibility and trust, right? Gotcha. I... Mm -hmm. I came and I was going to the meetings and talking to like the quote unquote power structure. And I think that while they liked the idea of what I was doing, that doesn't mean that they had any faith that I could do what I, I, I could, I said I could, right? 
it took time, it took consistency, it took gaining some traction, and it took being like, damn, she's still here. She's still, she's still doing this. And okay, it's it's like I'm seeing this group join in with her. Okay, so if they think she's cool, maybe, maybe she's got something here. It took time to get to the level of support that I now have. That didn't just happen overnight simply because I said, hey. I want to open a grocery store in Austin. I'm doing these pop-up markets. You know, there would be days where we did markets and like almost no one would come. And not for lack of trying to get people out. It's just that, you know, like you said, people have their routine. People are like, you know, that's nice. It's great that you're doing that. Some people would be like, you know, that's that's for other people. That's not for me. I can go to Oak Park. I can go to Belmont Craig and I can go to Tony's. I can go here or there. I don't need your, your market without understanding that it's not about, it wasn't about I'm doing this for people who need food or can't afford food. It's I'm trying to build something within this community so that you have you don't have to go to Belmont Cragen. You don't have to go to Oak Park. You can have this right here in your community. And what sometimes people focus on so much is the food, right? Is the access to fruits and vegetables. And it, and in the store, we're going to sell far more than just fruits and vegetables, it's about more than fruits and vegetables. It's about having infrastructure in your community, right? It's like the site that we're developing is going to look completely different than it does now, right? It's going to be, it's going to be architecture for the neighborhood, something nice for people to look at. It's a place that you can walk to the store now. So that gets you exercise. A grocery store is an anchor, so it helps bring in other businesses. It's an amenity that helps increase your home value. It provides jobs. Even a small grocery store can provide 15 to 20 jobs in a community. There's all the, it's social infrastructure, if you think about it, right? When you go to the store and you run into your neighbors or you run into your pastor or people from church and you, you create these community bonds in, in this social place, it does, it helps keep a community safer. It helps keep a community healthier and more than just a, I'm eating my veggies way. You, does that make sense? A lot. A lot has changed since the last time you and I spoke on the Drive at Five. Is there a change or difference in the Austin community response to fresh produce since the last time? We talked about, we had that discussion. Is there any change? I, I think you're asking the wrong question, right? And what here's why. Because I think you keep focusing on fresh produce. Like people aren't already eating fresh produce. So it's not as though I'm struggling to get people in Austin to eat an apple. If I put greens somewhere, you got a million and one people behind me like, how much is the greens? How much are the greens? Like we know fresh, fresh food. I don't have to change people's perception of fresh produce. I think it's what we talked about before. It's about where you access it. There's a reputation that I fight, that's what I fight against and the challenge I, I, cont I continuously have is that there's a perception that you can't get good, affordable, fresh food in Austin, that I have to go outside of my community to get, to get quality food, meats, produce, this, that, and the third. That, and, and so, I mean, even we even hear- Well, let me, let me, let me, Avenue. let me clarify the question mm -hmm. because I, I think it was misinterpreted. I said, is there like, you know how you do a comparison analysis? Yeah. Since the first time you started, right? Mm -hmm. And now, have you noticed a change or a difference? Because your tagline has fresh um, produce. So it, even though you provide much more, have you noticed a change in people coming up? You said during the pandemic, there, there was a change. And what I'm saying is, have there been a change since the last time we have spoken? Absolutely. Like our, like I said, the business. So can we discuss the change? Yeah. 
But what I'm saying is the change is not an attitude towards fresh produce. It's people being more aware that 40 acres exists and people seeing it as an option for them. It is people having, being willing to try things in their community. It's people being willing to like try grocery delivery service if they've never done it before. So I think there is a willingness once people find out that 40 acres exists and, um, or any of the, the, the myriad of food options in Austin exist, that people are starting to be like, I'm gonna make a point I'm going, to make, I'm going to make an intention. I think what we've seen as a result of the pandemic is people being more intentional in their actions, in their buying, in who they patronize and what they support because they understand there's, a, there's just a, a deeper understanding of, of the importance and the value of, of their dollar and of their support when it comes to small businesses, building local organizations, building local capacity, and what they want their neighborhoods to look like, and people feeling, I think, more invested in the role they play in that. What are the most challenging aspects in the community um, that lacks food apartheid? Well, that has food apartheid. Say that again? That has food apartheid, or that lacks fresh food. Okay, so... Um, let's discuss the challenging aspect. Basically, you're saying um, um, the challenge is basically advertisement. Am I correct or incorrect on that? I think it goes beyond advertisement. I think advertising is is important. Um, it's reaching people. It's knowing where to reach people. It's knowing where people will see you because. If let's say that I'm doing a a very grassroots approach to my marketing and I'm going to community meetings, after a while in Austin, you start to realize it's the same like 50 to 100 people at all the meetings. And so you're like, am I really reaching anybody new um, with what I'm doing? If you're canvassing, right? And you're putting flyers or door hangers on people's doors, that's a lot of work. You need manpower. That's a lot of printing. So um, there's, there's an expense with that level of, of outreach. Um, so that will always be a challenge um, because budgets are, are limited, um, labor costs, and you have, you have to pay people for their time to, to go out and help you do those things. I think that's often the biggest challenge is um, getting the word out so that you get awareness and you get people's attention. And then when you get people's attention is making them is getting them to trust and believe that what you say you have to offer is the real deal and that they want to they want to do that in their community. I think that'll always be the challenge. 40 Acres received the grant from Oprah Winfrey and, and can you tell us about that and um, other things that's going on? Yeah, so in 2020, um, a a group of of local organizations got together to form Live Healthy Chicago. So it was 40 acres, my block, my hood, my city. That's led by Jamal Cole on the south side, Rush Hospital, West Side United, uh, and Motha Redemption Project. We all came together to um, pool our different skill sets. Um, around response response in the hardest hit communities by COVID. And uh, 40 Acres was asked to join because we, because we did food. People knew the work that, we, that I've been doing and that 40 Acres have been doing since 2018, all of a sudden in 2020 got really important. And when, some, when you know, the people at the table asked like, well, who can do food? I guess all that grinding, I guess people were listening because when the time came, people were like, I know someone, 40 Acres, they do fresh produce, they, they do this food thing. And so that's how 40 Acres got pulled into it. Um, Oprah awarded, I believe, $5 million to Live Healthy Chicago, um, most of which went to community grants um, in um, across the, the, 10, the 10 focused neighborhoods of you know, 20 focused neighborhoods of Live Live Healthy Chicago across the South Side and the West Side. So 40 Acres did get a a 
portion. Um, they got a grant from, from that. Um, well, as a member of Live Healthy Chicago, we got a grant in order to, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Increase our capacity to do more of what we were already doing, which was delivering food, getting food out to people um, and doing it affordably, being able to hire um, and grow, grow our impact and grow our business so we could have more impact um, through the pandemic and beyond. There is more money and opportunities um, that's out there, um, especially in the Austin community. What 40 acres need in order to stay afloat? There, there was a recent grant that was awarded um, to Soul City, if I'm saying it correctly, uh, $2.5 million. Can you discuss that in the money opportunities and your organization in order to stay afloat? So what 40 Acres needs to stay afloat is to do good business. So we're not a nonprofit. Um, ultimately, I don't want to be a business that runs off of grants. It's great for startup capital because you don't have to pay it back. Um, but ultimately, 40 Acres should be running off its own revenue. So my focus is always you know, running as efficiently as possible so that, you know, our costs are, are kept under control and then growing that top line revenue with more customers, more business. And so the best way that 40 acres can stay afloat is to get more customers, to have more people buying, to have more people know who we are, try our service and continue with our service, come shop at our pop-ups. And then when the store opens, shop at the store. So from that perspective, that's what's needed. Um, in terms of the capital to, to build our store, you're right, we're living in a time where there is a lot of, in the words of Jay-Z, there's money to be had. Um, the city just got $1.2 billion from the federal government and has released the Chicago Recovery Grant. There's the Neighborhood Opportunity Fund. There's private foundations that have funding that is specifically towards um, community health and food's a big part of that. Um, so that has been useful in building the capital stack needed to actually develop the store because the, the site that we built was an old Salvation Army, right? It wasn't a grocery store. You can't just buy the site, put in some refrigeration and open it up and say you're a grocery store. You have to, you have to completely rehab that, that location. And that's a very expensive undertaking and so um, Soul City Chicago is, it, there's been some confusion about that funding because the, the corridor of Chicago Avenue is called Soul City, but um, the award for the NOF that just went out to Soul City Chicago was with Soul City Chicago LLC, which is simply a partnership between myself and Westside Health Authority to develop the property at 5713 West Chicago Avenue into a grocery store, which will be the first 40 acres fresh market brick and mortar store. So two and a half million dollars is going towards that project for eligible expenses, which basically means construction. So is that a good thing or is is split up? What do you mean? What I what I mean is basically, is it going directly towards this project? Yeah, or? that's it. That, like, there's, there is no other like, so Soul City Chicago is simply just the entity that applied for the grant. That's it. Okay. So it's not going towards the entire corridor. It's strictly going to this property and the construction of a grocery store and the commercial space, which will house a grocery store on this property. Okay, so that's exciting news for you, right? It's amazing news because that was a major part of our capital stack plan. So I think what's interesting is I've never done this before. This is like, this is real commercial real estate development. And I underestimated, um, I underestimated what it takes to get something like this done. I underestimated the level of infrastructure needed. Um, I like, for example, we have to move to ComEd, we have to get ComEd to move two, no, three, three electrical poles um, on the property. We have to get them to relocate those poles so that we can move the, the curb cut for the driveway into the parking lot 
from the Chicago Avenue side to the Waller side, because that makes more sense for the business. Um, that's an undertaking in and of itself. Um, we have involvement from, from CDOT, um, the, the levels of like plumbing and, and what's that stuff called? Mechanical and engineering, all of those things that have to be upgraded get really expensive. They take a long time to, to develop and design because it has to work with the design of the store. So I think I initially, when we, when we secured the, the property in 2020, I was like, we'll be open in a year. And, you know, it's more than a year later. It's, we're in 2022 now. We haven't even broken ground on construction, not because anything has gotten held up or because the project is stalled, but because it's far more complex than, than I ever could have imagined. And I think um, when people see, what's this two and a half million for Soul City? What's that? I just first want to tell them, like, it's the grocery store just it's just it's just a naming thing don't worry about it it's still going to this grocery store but also people are like well I haven't seen anything happen you know people are getting all this money and nothing moves there's a lot happening underneath the surface that I'm just not going to make an announcement about every little thing we do you know well that's that comes to the question of action and rhetoric like we discussed before and and a lot of people what you don't know or don't see is kind of like when people promise transparency in, mm -hmm. in some of these meetings, they expect just that transparency. And what you just said, like every nook and cranny is not going to be discussed. That wasn't made available to people that that's like, okay, you said transparency, what's going on? Why is it a standstill? What is this? And, and then you get the who, what, when, where, and how, and there you have it disarray. So it, it's not just that because a lot of people, and you hear rumblings mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. So it, it's, it's kind of like, you know, um, basically what you're saying, chill out. It's just the naming is, is going where it's supposed to go. And, and if there's any misconception, you know, it, it will be handled. Correct. Absolutely. And so I think that, I, how do I put this? I'm gonna use another example. Do you remember Lincoln Yards and like the controversy around the development in Lincoln Yards and how they were gonna get like a hundred million dollars of TIF for a site in what everybody knows is a pretty well-to-do area already? Yes. Okay, so that was back before Lori, but that was, that was in Rom's administration. Lincoln Yards, nothing has opened in Lincoln Yards. It has been years. So it would look like that project is at a standstill, something's wrong. But development just takes time. Getting, getting the site is just one step, right? Getting the funding is just one step. There's so many different moving pieces to this that I think that sometimes when a community hasn't had a lot of development, it can look like nothing's happening because you have no frame of reference for what the timeline should be. You know, I know I didn't have a frame of reference for what the timeline should be on this project and I way underestimated it. So while it can look like people are just sitting on property, nothing's happening. I think that like, it's, I think this is good because I feel like as a community, we can kind of learn together about what the expectation should be and what, what it really takes to to transform a neighborhood in terms of infrastructure and, and construction and, and, opening, and opening new businesses. Because I just don't think we have a frame of reference for that. And I think so that's oftentimes what causes the, the confusion and the anxiety of like, I'm not seeing what I think I should be seeing. So that must mean something's wrong. Correct. So please give intellectualradio.com slash iHeartRadio station where they can get in contact with you, um, and we're going to have you to come back to have further discussions on that if, if you yeah, want to. Yeah, I just want to say one thing. Um, so Soul City Community Market is a neighborhood, it's going to be a neighborhood indoor pop-up market at 
the site of the future grocery store at 5713 West Chicago Avenue. It's going to be like an indoor fresh market with multiple vendors, including 40 acres fresh market, nuts to go, and you know, prepared food, all different kinds of food right here in the Austin community, kicking off February 5th. It's going to run every weekend, Saturday and Sunday, Saturday from nine to three, Sunday from 10 to three. 5713 West Chicago. And I just really want to let people know that. Um, please come out and support that. You can find more information. Um, Soul City Community Market has an Instagram page with all the information. Um, there's a Facebook event that has been that's been circulating. Roman, you know, I'm gonna ask you to share that and invite people like I used to do them back in the day. And I'm gonna bother you until you do it. Um, and then if you if you wanna know more about 40 Acres Fresh Market, uh, you can find us online at 40acresfreshmarket.com. That is the, the word 40, you can see it on my shirt. Uh, F-O-R-T-Y, Acres, A-C-R-E-S, Fresh, F-R-E-S-H, and Market. M-A-R-K-E-T dot com. And you can find out about our delivery service, our pop-up schedule, and um, sign up for our newsletter so that you can get weekly updates about um, store progress and you know what we're doing. All right, well, thank you so much. When we come back, coming up on the Drive at Five on intellectualradio.com slash iHeartRadio station, African reps and where just in time for Black History Month coming up on The Drive. Have a good one. How you doing? Oh. I'm well. Oh, you're well. Sorry about the wait. <laughs> No problem. I think we're still live on Facebook. Yeah, I know. Um, I, I hear a little bit of a feedback. Okay. Yep, that should be better. Okay, no problem. <clears throat> and let me know when you're ready. I am ready. Okay. And we're back on the drive at five on intellectualradio.com slash iHeartRadio station. My next guest via Zoom is an entrepreneur and creative director of Dawning Creation, LLC. Please give a drive at five. Welcome to Latricia, Lucretia, sorry, <laughs> Atkins. Welcome to the drive. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Yes, thank you for having me. Appreciate it. So please give intellectualradio.com slash iHeartRadio Station your background. Yes. Well, um, I'm from the suburbs of Chicago. That's where I was raised. Um, Donny Day Creations was founded in 2014, uh, a little bit after the birth of my daughter. Um, you know, they say there's an African proverb that says children are the reward of life. And I truly believe that happened when she came in, into my life, just sparked a lot of energy and creativity. Um, and so I started off the business um, as a self-taught seamstress and um, started making baby bibs and clothes for my daughter. Um, and then I found out, hey, I love to do this. And then uh, family and friends started asking me, hey, can you make me this? Can you make me this? So I was like, yeah, I think so. And I was like, hey, I think this, this is it right here. This is our business. So um, <laughs> that's how we started. Um, so we've been in business for almost eight years, um, but we uh, incorporated last year. So we're super excited about that. So we're coming up on our one year of being um, founded, I guess. Um, and then... Um, yeah, that's how we started. That's Dawn and Day Creations. We're here uh, for the culture. And it was um, even my goal back then, you know, when you're in your early 30s trying to figure out life, right? Where, what am I supposed to do? Where is, what is my purpose, right? Um, 
and so I knew that I wasn't the greatest orator where I was going to, you know, be talking about, you know, black history and, you know, loving ourselves and helping the community in that way. But um, again, when I found sewing and creativity, I was like, hey, this is a way for me to um, impact my community in a positive way by um, offering clothing that you know, brings out the royalty in them, you know, so because when we feel good about ourselves, when we feel good about our history and culture, there's so much more we can do that when we feel confident and empowered and positive about our brothers and sisters when we look at them, right? Um, when we view our world a little bit differently. So yeah, that that's a little bit about Dawn and Day Creations and how we started and why we're here and why we're continuing to um, do what we do. So tell us a little bit about what was the the inspiration behind creating African print wraps and wear. Yeah, so that's again, um, I would go back to when my daughter was born. Um, at that time, um, me and my husband, we were wearing, we wear African print garb, right? We wear, um, you know, mud cloth and, you know, African print shirts and dashikis and, and, you know, all that stuff. So I felt that why I asked myself, why can't my daughter wear the same things that we wear as a baby? Um, why do I have to wait until she's two years old, three years old? Because most of the products out there started at 2T, 3T. But I wanted her to know that it's okay for you to wear, you know, African uh, prints and to to see it on herself. Um, and also just not look like every other baby out there wearing other branded stuff that you can find in a huge department store, right? With trucks and ponies and unicorns and all that stuff, right? Um, so I think that was the biggest inf inspiration is just wanting my daughter to know at a, at a very young age and see the colors and know that, hey, your African culture is beautiful. It's nothing that you need to wait until you're an adult to appreciate or enjoy. Um, so, yeah. More and more people are embracing African prints and wear. Why do you think it's becoming more popular now more than ever? I'm not sure, but I'm here for it, and I love it. Um, I would say, one, I think um, just with things that happen in society that people are realizing, um, you know, that we really have to stick stick together, right? That, that sticking together as Black people is more important than ever. Um, and then with that, being um, unapologetically proud of who we are as um, Black people, as Africans here in America, um, and proud of our culture and not having to hide it. You know what I'm saying? Um, I think I think we've come to a point where like we don't we don't give a care, right? Or like we don't care. We're going to do our thing. We're going to show ourselves. We're going to be boisterous. We're going to, you know, um, one of my, uh, you know, teachers for uh, meditation talks about your throat chakra. We're going to open up our throat chakra. We're talking. We're speaking. Right. Um, so we're expressing ourselves and our history in, in, in a, again, in an unapologetic way. And I'm not sure. And I think it's a, a, just a thing that's slowly been happening over time, you know, um, but I love it. Um, and then I think it also helped, maybe or maybe not, that um, high fashion started to embrace uh, African <laughs> prints. So you've seen it on Vogue and et cetera, like those big magazines, right? They had... Um, you know, runway shows with them wearing African prints, right? So it became quote unquote acceptable um, in high fashion as well. But um, just on a, on a lower end with community, um, I believe it's just a way for us to say, hey, we love who we are. We love our culture. We love our history. And this is one way that we can express it 
um, and also connect with each other. Because when you see another sister with a head wrap on, hey, you know you have a connection. Or you see a brother with, you know, a mud cloth on or a shirt with a Africa, you know, on it with some, you know, a little extra flair. You know, hey, we got something in common. We're connected. So, yeah. Do, do you think it involves embracing the culturalism and, and, and the heritage? Um, yes, I think so. I think it, it has a, a part of that. Mm -hmm. um, and then it may just be, you know, trends, right? We have to think about that, that some things are just trendy. Um, but I feel like the community here in Chicago, there there's a group of us that this is a lifestyle, right? Um, and I'm sure there's other communities and, and other areas in the U.S. where this is just not something that we do when, you know, during Kwanzaa or Black History Month. It's like every day. Like, I wore this shirt right here that I have on. Like, this, I, I didn't wear it for the show. I was wore it this morning. You know what I'm saying? Like, this is just what I wear. You know, it's like normal on a daily basis, you know, to go out. It's not like a show. Um and I think there's a strong community that's used to doing that. Um, and then the the younger people that are coming on, their parents, they see them dressed like this all the time. And their house is full of, you know, African home decor and, and other things like that. Um, and so then it just, it's almost normal, right? Um, and then there's a group of people that are still learning or, or they just like the colors and the vibrancy. But again, it's just that little bit that you may capture to make you then become curious about, oh, where's the history behind this? Where's this come from? So that you can really start embracing, you know, who we are um, as a people. So, yeah. There, there are differences in the rap in African prints, as you mentioned, you, there's the mud, mud cloth um, prints. And can you tell us about those differences in the raps and the African prints? Um, yeah, a little bit. Um, so I'm not a huge expert on this. I'll start to say that. Now, the one that I have here, this is cotton fabric, and this is a print um, that was, you know, put onto cotton, and it's um, it's not stretchy. Um, so this is one way that, you know, we can wear head wraps. Um, traditionally, there's the wax prints um, that are much stiffer. And so that's where you'll see like some of those big wedding um, galas, you know, the really big ones that are like standing up, they're beautiful and they're shiny. Um, those are, are a different type of fabric that you would use to do that. And um, you will find those in Nigeria, I know in some other places um, in, um, West Africa, right? No, East Africa. I'm not sure. I have to look that up. I have to look that up. But, um, yeah, so that's one type. And then you have, like, Bazin. You have um, so many different fabrics. Now, mud cloth, I don't really see that as common for head wraps. I see that more for, like, clothing and skirts and shirts and things of that sort. Um, I'm sure you probably could wrap it, but it, it's, that is a very, that's a woven fabric. So that would be very like stiff and heavy on the head. Um, but there are some other woven fabrics that I know, um, even I have some, I didn't bring them down though. That's why I'm like looking around to see if I can grab one, um, to show you, but it's upstairs, but I do have one on, but I can't remember where, where that's from in Africa. I don't want to um, say the wrong thing, but there are some woven fabrics that you can also use as head wraps as well. Also, you have bags, shirts, and dresses that are African print. And I, I just want you to describe to us the difference between an African print dress and an Americanized dress because it's, it's, it's different. And you see the differences, as you um, stated earlier, about the shirts, like a regular shirt, let's say, the wear versus a dashiki shirt. Can you describe that like an Americanized dress, an Americanized shirt for us versus an African print? Mm, 
What do you mean? What do you mean by like, like a literally a dress or how we dress? Well, a literal dress and the African print dress. Well, okay. this is just given like look. Like I went to your Facebook page and you have worn um, a couple of African print dresses. Now, looking at the fabric and the texture of the American um, nice dress is is different. I don't know mm -hmm. because I don't wear a dress as you can see. Um, <laughs> I just wanted to know about the differences. Hmm. Well, I'll just say from personal experience, because um, I haven't um, done any uh, research on um, the fashion industry as it compares to style and, um, you know, compare some of like European fashion to African, right? Um, but I will say that the garments that I wear, it's, 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 I don't know. I almost want to say it's just a feeling, yo. Like when you're wearing African print clothes, like you just feel like royalty. Like it, it's just a different feeling. And the fit is, it just makes you throw your shoulders back a little bit more. It, I don't know. I, I want to say it's more of a feeling. And even like with the fit, with European fits, more cut, you know, at the waist. And not even say that. Some African garbs, you, they, they, you know, they can get nice and cut here at the waistline as well. But, um, yeah, I, I, I don't have a good answer for you, Roman. I'm sorry. It's, it's, it's almost, no, no it, it, it's like a feeling. It's like, at least, and again, this is from personal experience. I know, um, I'm, I'm about 5'10", almost 5'11", um, pretty slender, like athletic built. And until I started wearing African clothes, I never really felt great in in clothes. Like my jeans flooded, like, you know, my shirts never fit me right. Um, I tried to dress up, you know, like in dresses, dresses just didn't fit me right. You know, it, it's a different type of feeling when I wore a mud cloth skirt or when I wore my lapa with my matching top and my matching head wrap, like, it was like, okay, this is it. This is where I'm supposed to be at. So, yeah. <laughs> so you you also have uh, uh, um, bags that's African um, print, jackets that are African print. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Okay, say so the first part again. You have bags. Um, like book bags that are okay. African print. You have um, um, kind of like um, jackets that are African print. Can mm -hmm. you tell us a little bit about that? Sure, yeah. So um, recently, maybe like just five months ago, we started um, getting products um, sent over here from Ghana from the makers um, there in the motherland. And it's been a wonderful thing. Um, so we have backpacks and duffel bags, as well as some clothing that is uh, handmade in Ghana. And um, it was a beautiful thing for, for two main reasons. One, I've, it's always been my goal to, um, you know, when we talk about cooperative economics, right, to um, have that type of relationship financially with those directly in Africa, you know, because I'm talking about the motherland all the time. I'm talking about African prints. So the question is, is my money going there? You know what I'm saying? Where's my money going? So I've always wanted to be able to have that um, economical uh, relationship um, with makers there. And then secondly, it's helped on our end just as a business where I'm not having to make everything that our clients love to have. Um, because it just came to a point where there's like stuff that I wanted in the store and stuff our clients wanted, but I'm like, I can't make head wraps and turn headbands and skirts and, and fannies and all this stuff. You know, I want to, I want to have a boutique, but me just doing it myself was just unrealistic. So, um, 
it's just been great to get products that our clients love um, and also get, um, you know, support the makers over there um, in the motherland in Ghana. Okay. Now, you are celebrating eight years, as you mentioned, eight years as an entrepreneur. However, the surprising factor is you were self-taught. Tell us about being self-taught as an entrepreneur, because usually if you're self-taught and an entrepreneur, you're not going to last that long. Mm -hmm. Tell us about yeah, um, I don't know. I've been blessed, but I will say that I, even though I've been in business for eight years, it was very part time, right? Like I just started off as, hey, this is some fun. I love to do. I ended. I was an at home mom for like the first year after my daughter was born, so I needed something to do, right? To keep all the mamas know, keep yourself sane when you're in the house twenty four seven. Um, so um i um hold on one second i'm so sorry no no problem okay sorry y'all that was a little one um <laughs> so i started off very part-time and and but it ended up being good because i never went um i never had to like dig into like my funds to start the business like the business took care of itself like it paid for itself right but it was small i um, mean i'll just do small orders here and there do things for family and custom orders and then i did pop-ups here and there right um and then i was still working throughout the that seven year period like on and off right so it was just kind of like this thing I love to do. I wouldn't even call it a side hustle because I just like doing it. So I still called it a business, but it was just not a business that I was really taking seriously. Like, hey, we can really grow. And it wasn't until maybe just about a year ago that um, uh, I had this aha moment that, wait a minute, like Donna Day Creations can really be a business, right? Um, and so I would, again, that's what I'll say I would, I feel like we're we're almost brand new again, like renewed. Um, but I think one, we didn't have a large overhead and we weren't um, spending more than we didn't have. So I think that helped us last um, all this time. Secondly, we found our client base very early and we did our best to, you know, give good customer service every single time and, you know, never took anything for granted when we got an order, right? Or that when we serviced our clients, um, you know, in person at pop-ups and, um, yeah, our customers are just amazing. Like, I just love our clients because they just keep coming back. So it's like that has helped sustain us over the years. Um, and then uh, I would just say always learning. Like, I was just always learning here and there, just continually learning. But um, in this last year, I've really put the gas on it. Like, okay, let's make let's make some things happen. So, um, yeah, I think that's that's what has brought us here to this eight year mark is um not overspending um have having a good client base and really uh, giving good customer service throughout that time being consistent um because even though we weren't big and we weren't always you know online or doing something like that um people knew where to find us you know we had a website we were present um and uh, and you know um yeah so that's it <laughs> no, no problem so please give intellectualradio.com slash iheart radio station where they can um get in contact with you um where your um um wraps and african brand clothing line um in stores at and all that other good stuff yes thank you so a few ways we're open 24 7 seven days a week all year online at www.ddcwraps.com. And then you can find us, find our products in store at Afriwear Books. 
um, which is in Maywood, Illinois. And then you can also find us at ME Marketplace, which is at 7451 Madison Street in Forest Park, Illinois. That's our newest location. We've only been there for a few weeks. Um, so we really ask for you all to come up there and um, shop with us and support us there as well as the other um vendors and businesses at that location. Um, so those are our main two retail locations. You can find us online and more to come. We have uh, some things in the works for getting our products in another location um, very soon. So, And especially for Black History Month, a lot of people are looking for African garments. Are, is there any any way that um, you can um, let people know who is looking for specially made African garments or um, what you have on right now? Can you stand up and let people? Um, oh, this yeah. this is a mine. This is a throwback. Oh, this is like throwback. my husband's from years ago. But oh, okay. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> what um, head wrap you have on it that they like? Um, how they can um, get access for tailor-made um, stuff for Black History. Yeah, so um, I am accepting some custom orders uh, this month, but only just limited limited amount because I already have one come in. So that'll be um, a big project in itself. But we um, specialize in skirts um, for custom orders and head wrap. So if you want a head wrap with a matching skirt or, you know, whatever, um, I can definitely do that curate, um, you know, a, a, a print that you would like for your, your head wrap collection. Um, especially if you have a group who's doing a, a Black History an event, you know, the children are doing a Black History, um, you know, something at their assembly or the church or anything like that. We would love to assist you um, with providing head wraps for those. Um, and as far as our clothing, we do have some clothing, some tunic tops, as well as some um, dusters at our location in Forest Park. Uh, we also have some clothing at Afriwear Books, um, which is on First Avenue. Um, I can't think. I think it's 1701 um, First Avenue in the Eisenhower Tower at, at the um, on the fourth floor. So Suite 400. So we also have clothing there as well. All right. Um, don't be a stranger to the drive at five. Um, love having you here. So um, please, anytime. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you for having us. No problem. That's going to do it for us on the Drive at 5 on the intellectualradio.com slash iHeartRadio station. Thanks to Earl back in the studio. Wanda, who's behind the scenes. You guys have a wonderful week.